Today's webinar is titled Exploring Silvicultural Strategies in Vermont's Changing Forests in the Northern Hardwoods. Our presenter today is Tony D'Amato. Tony is an Associate Professor of Silviculture and Applied Forest Ecology in the Rubenstein School of the Environment and Natural Resources at the University of Vermont. His research focuses on long-term forest dynamics, disturbance effects on, forest, on ecosystem structure and function, and silviculture strategies for conferring adaptation potential within the context of global change. He received his BS in Forest Ecosystem Science from the University of Maine, an MS in Forest Science from Oregon State University, and a PhD in Forest Resources from University of Massachusetts. He is a faculty member for seven years at the University of Minnesota prior to joining the University of Vermont in January 2015. And with that, Tony, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate, and thanks, folks, for logging on this morning for the webinar. Um, these are always, as I was discussing with Kate, a little bit awkward staring at my computer screen um, versus looking at a group of uh, folks in a workshop. So I'll picture all of you smiling over your coffees, uh, imagining wonderful northern hardwood forests. Um, as Kate mentioned, really, this is the first of a series of, of webinars that are going to be dealing with managing uh, forests in Vermont within the context of different changes that are occurring out there. And so today what I'll be doing is giving an overview of the silvics and, and, and management approaches that we've used for northern hardwoods in the region and then getting into kind of a broad framework that's being used to think about how do we adapt and change our thinking about our civil cultural objectives within the context of of all the changes affecting our forests in terms of both climate as well as the stressors that are currently affecting them like invasive species and insects and diseases and so just as a, a general outline Basically, again, it'd be kind of civil culture 101, giving you some background or a refresher on just the, the common silvics of the species that exist in these types, as well as just how we've been approaching civil culture in these forests over the past 70 years, and then get into talking about really at the national and now global scale how folks are thinking about trying to reframe our civil cultural objectives to address the range of uncertainties about our future forests and their ability to sustain the services that we value from them and then get into some specific examples, particularly dealing with northern hardwood forests and how what we do in response to these changes may or may not look much different than how we've always managed these forests and in many cases might just be a, a recalibration of how we view the outcomes of our civil cultural prescriptions. So I'm going to start off with hopefully some great flashbacks to when you were a student taking civil culture and really get into kind of the core of understanding how to manage northern hardwoods and review some basic silvics of the species as well as the common forest types that we think about with northern hardwood systems and then some of the civil culture. And I'd be remiss not to mention that the vast majority of this really builds on the amazing knowledge base that both Bill Leake and Ralph Nyland have developed for these forest types in the Northeast. And so we're spoiled to have that to look at and rely on to get a good feel for how these forests respond over time to management as well as how they behave. And so again, I apologize for those that are now thinking back to when they were tortured with these fun facts as a, as a forestry student. But basically one of the key elements, particularly as we think about these forests going forward, is that it's always useful to revisit what are the functional characteristics and silvics of the species that are within the forest that we're trying to manage. And so northern hardwood forests we tend to define largely by sugar maple, beech, and birch, but certainly there's a diversity of species that exist within these forests. And what's useful to think about as we look at just the shade tolerance of species in these forests is that the dominant components, both beech as well as sugar maple, certainly are very tolerant species. And that speaks very well to the disturbance dynamics that historically affected these forests. Small gap scale disturbances really suited for releasing um, established advanced regeneration. But if we look at some of the other species that certainly can be secondary components of these forests, whether it's ash all the way to aspen, there certainly are species that have relied historically on mesoscale disturbances, so larger canopy gaps or stand scale events that have allowed the recruitment and maintain maintenance of these species over time. And so despite the fact that we think of these forests as largely tolerant dominated systems, there's quite a range of, 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 of types and as a result a range of strategies, either slow, slow growth early on and, and release or fast growth within gaps to allow them to compete with existing advanced regeneration on the site. One thing I'll keep referring to throughout is that site certainly matters dramatically in terms of the outcomes as it relates to northern hardwood forests. As you look at the constituent species within these systems, certainly sugar maple, white ash are species that both have very high site requirements and in particular when we think of sugar maple, it's a species that can exist across a wide range of sites, but when we focus in on the ability to regenerate that species and get high yields from that species, it's really on the highest quality sites that we're able to do that. Whereas some of the species that we commonly associate with it, particularly beech, 
but also red maple tend to have a much broader ecological amplitude and are able to exist across a, a wider range of sites, creating challenges depending on what our desired outcome is for, the, for those sites. Besides thinking about just how the species behave in the shade or what type of soils they require, it's also useful from a subcultural standpoint to think about if, if we're thinking of regenerating these systems, what are the dynamics of that species as it relates to both its preferred seedbed as well as to the, the gap sizes that are required to recruit that. And so again, if we think about the natural dynamics of these forest ecosystems, you know, northern hardwood forests, really, you know, gap scale, fine scale, frequent disturbance with the occasional, you know, mesoscale disturbance that might create larger openings. And so the, the seed bed requirements for most of these species is quite unique relative to other forest types in that the dominant species actually do quite well on a litter seed bed. And if we think a little bit about this, you know, whether it's sugar maple, beech, red maple, white ash, all of these species have very large seeds. And as a result, their ability to penetrate that leaf litter is much higher than, say, yellow birch or a hemlock, which have much smaller seeds. And so for those species, in many cases, as long as there's an adequate duff layer, um, an adequate moisture in the understory, we're able to get germination and establish in those individuals um, with, with appropriate gap sizes. Whereas things like yellow birch, as well as hemlock and, and white pine, there's a need for that, that mineral soil exposure or, or at least mixture of humus and, and mineral soil that would have occurred under natural wind scale disturbances or other types of processes. And so related to that, when we look at the gap sizes that are required to recruit these species, many of these that are shade tolerant only need about a tenth acre gap to be recruited to the overstory, whereas others like paper birch and aspen need much larger gaps if we're, if we're to maintain them as part of the stand. And then finally, your last bit of silvix torture or trivia, one element of these systems is we think about their ability to respond both to our management as well as to respond to future disturbances that we have several species, particularly American beech, that are phenomenal sprouters, particularly from their root systems. And as a result of beech bark disease, we now have a lot of root suckering occurring in our forests. Whereas many of these other species, like sugar maple, white ash, are much, much less effective at sprouting, particularly from stump sprouts. And as a result, their ability to respond vegetatively to disturbances is much lower than some, some of the other species, like red maple and beech. So, as I mentioned, again, you know, site matters tremendously, and, and we owe a lot to both Bill Leake and, and Ralph Nyland for, you know, really characterizing both the range of sites that northern hardwoods exist across, as well as the, the range of outcomes we might expect. And I recognize that many of the participants on the, on the webinar today are from Vermont, and so are, are used to using kind of our natural community classifications, but kind of to, to cast this more broadly, um, in, in terms of the main forest types, I'm using what, how Bill Leake categorizes these, where Depending on the, the richness of the site and the parent material, we have a range of northern hardwood types that we recognize, and as a result, a range of outcomes that might occur on those sites in terms of silvicultural prescriptions. And so the first forest type that we recognize, what we might call a rich northern hardwood forest in Vermont, is a sugar maple ash type, which exists either in places where we have either enriched bedrock material, so calcareous bedrock, or enriched locations in the landscape, so benches or coves or places where we have a lot of colluvium, delivering organic material and creating these, these localized enriched sites within our, our broader landscape. So as a result, the characteristic species we think of are, are species that really do have higher site requirements like sugar maple, white ash, and basswood. This is certainly the type that we get most excited about in terms of sugar maple production, but in general when we think of what makes up the majority of the matrix of our forests here in Vermont and throughout the Northeast, it's more of this, this what we consider the generic northern hardwood type or beech sugar maple yellow birch type. And this again, it certainly has you know, moderate to sometimes moderately high levels of, of nutrient availability, but is much more um, across you know, well to moderately well-drained tills, less enriched sites, and, and as a result, sugar maple can be less competitive on these sites over time, depending on the management. And then moving down the gradient of productivity of the beech red maple type, which again, getting into even more droughty sites, sandy loose tills where um, you know, sugar maple really struggles to compete. And then finally, what we kind of view is this catch-all, this mixed wood type, which essentially corresponds to northern hardwoods with a heavy conifer component, generally existing in places where that conifer component is encouraged either due to some impediment to rooting depth due to shallow to bedrock soils, or we have some sort of hard pan that's re restricting um, rooting. And so certainly a very important type as we get into higher elevation systems in Vermont, as well as as we move into the Northeast Kingdom and other places where we have shallower soils um, across the landscape. So for today, I'll be largely focusing on you know, the, the top two forest types, um, but nonetheless, certainly we'll have examples that also refer to the mixed wood and, and beech red maple type out there in the landscape. So 
when we think about the natural ecology of these forests and certainly the forests that folks were experiencing as they were trying to f figure out the civil culture for northern hardwood systems, a lot of the way we view northern hardwood forests in terms of their natural dynamics, again, is that these are uneven age systems that are, that are dominated by tolerant species. And as a result, when we first started to think about developing civil cultural prescriptions and regeneration methods for managing these forests, there was a strong focus on particularly uneven age management and specifically single tree selection. And so really over the past you know, 70 years, there's been a lot of experience with single tree selection and certainly many of you have practiced or, or have tried at least single tree selection within northern hardwoods. And it certainly is an approach that um, you know, is widely supported based on just understanding the natural ecology of these forests. And generally, again, not to you know, you know, belabor all the fun facts you learn in civil culture, but the real approach was to manage to some target diameter distribution, usually some sort of reverse J-shaped distribution. And a lot of this was supported by work that came out of Arthur Meyer's research looking at old growth forests across the um, kind of temperate forest ecosystems. And so these are just the diameter distributions from um, Pennsylvania, from Switzerland, from New Hampshire, from Minnesota. And what he found when he looked at these old growth northern hardwood systems, if he plotted the diamond distribution, you know, on a graph like this, we get this characteristic reverse J-shaped curve. And as a result, you know, we've been using that, and again, certainly borrowing from earlier discoveries in France of a similar phenomenon, using that as a guiding target structure for, for how we should manage our forest for single, using single tree selection. One important point about this is that actually Meyer's work it really was based on looking at a landscape as opposed to the stand scale. And so many of these distributions that he was finding actually were, were based on landscape scale diameter distributions as opposed to stand scale distributions. But nonetheless, we've really taken this approach and use it as a way to guide how we do single tree selection. And so this has been used and certainly still has, a, has its place in, in northern hardwood management. But there's really been some issues with single tree selection that particularly Bill Leake's work, but also some of the work that Ralph Nyland has done, has spoken to in terms of some of the challenges with using single tree selection across the range of sites that northern hardwoods exist upon. And one is that if we think about the tolerance of the species in these forests, even though we might be very excited about sugar maple with our single tree selection system, it is not the most tolerant tree species in this forest, you know, beech is. And so as a result, when we make single tree fall removal such as this one, basically we're really playing towards the recruitment strategy of beech to really establish under low light. Compounding that is with beech bark disease, we now have an abundance of, of, of root sucker beech in the understory, and so as a result, what might happen is we still will get that structure we're looking for. So we have a lot of small stems and, and fewer medium-sized stems and even fewer large stems, but much of that structure is now being made up by beech, and so you know, the ability to sustain it over time is low. Another issue with that is we've taken what was really designed based on an understanding of old growth, uneven age systems, and are often sometimes trying to apply single tree selection to forests that are, on, are in an even age stand condition. And as a result, very quickly into, the, into our second cutting cycle, we don't have the age classes and the size classes to sustain that structure over time. Essentially, we, you know, we are, are taking a stand that's even age and trying to assume that we can get small size classes recruited in um, and, and to, to fill any deficits that are on that site. And likewise, due to beech bark disease, as well as just the history of our management, many of our sites have been exploitatively logged, we might not have the quality um, to carry these low volume removals over time. And so single tree selection really relies on there being a high proportion of high quality stems in that stand. So when we have situations like this stand on the right hand side where we certainly have some nice sugar maple, but the majority of that stand is in a low quality condition, you don't have the volumes to really justify you know, small scale removals. And so as a result, really there's been a shift in focus, particularly um, through the long-term work that, that Bill Leake has done towards thinking about trying to manage in an uneven age fashion, again, emulating some of the dynamics that historically occurred in these forests, but doing it through gap, gap and patch selection methods. And so instead of doing single tree removals, focusing more on creating you know, small to large gaps that both provide a, a range of recruitment opportunities, so things like yellow birch and in some cases even, even aspen, depending on the size of the gap, but also are, are a way to convert a lot of these even age stands into an uneven age structure. And so creating kind of a series of gaps over every 10 to 15 years and over time creating a diversity of age classes across that forest. And from an implementation standpoint, in many respects it's much easier to, to implement, particularly if you're using single tree removals in between the gaps, in that you can apply similar to what we would do with a clear cutting type approach, area regulation across an area, um, and do it. 
and those of you familiar with Bill Leak's work, in many cases what's, what happens is not only are groups of trees being removed from the overstory, but also either through the harvesting or through deliberate cutting, removing all the existing advanced regeneration in those gaps to try to create a greater diversity of species as opposed to releasing the beach. So, so uneven age methods certainly have been our, our primary approach. And if, if we look at kind of the long-term results of, of some of the work that, that Bill Leak has done at the Bartlett Experimental Forest, um, some of the early findings that both he, he and Wilson found in the late 50s, after one cutting cycle and single tree selection, what they were finding is that you know, the vast majority of regeneration on those sites was, was shade tolerant. Certainly, we're, we're not upset if a lot of that sugar maple, but over time, what they found is it became you know, a greater proportion of beech. Whereas if we look at group selection, we still have you know, this high component of shade tolerance, but we're now getting a much larger mid-tolerant component. And then moving all the way to clear cutting, we certainly are increasing the proportion of these intolerant species like paper birch and aspen, but we're still maintaining some of that tolerant component given that many of these species rely on advanced regeneration to establish. And so when we clear cut a site, we still have those species out there to regenerate. Beyond looking at uneven age methods, we certainly use shelter wood methods as well, and it's certainly a very appropriate method for northern hardwoods. If we think about the, the ecology of these systems, really emulating some of those more mesoscale uh, top-down disturbances that might take up a portion of the canopy out, but still retain and preserve that advanced regeneration on the site. And the way that shelter wood methods have traditionally been applied, and most of our experience with shelter wood methods in northern hardwoods are, are using largely uniform shelter woods, so a uniform reduction of that overwood at the time of the establishment cutting, to typically 50% of the relative density, so anywhere from 50 to 80 square feet being retained on that site. And then depending on both the objectives as well as kind of the, the vigor of the overstory, either removing that in, in, in anywhere from five to 15 years. And so if we remove that overwood quickly, certainly we, we are able to maintain a greater diversity of species of, of lower tolerance. If we retain that overwood for an extended period of time, we're shifting that, that composition more towards um, advanced regeneration that is, that is tolerant. As is the case with uneven age methods, again, with our northern hardwoods, because we have both sugar maple and beech species that are able to establish as advanced regeneration in that system, with shelter woods, one of the key elements is, is recognizing what already exists out there as advanced regeneration as you think about what the long-term outcomes will be. And Ralph Nyland really has some of the best collection of studies looking at that and, and basically has done some work in in the Adirondacks where, you know, in stands where there was an existing beach understory, they've done a chemical removal, so misspraying mis of, of that beach and actually killed the beach understory at the time of the establishment cutting. And this picture here in the lower right-hand corner is actually what some of these shelter woods look like 20 years later, where the vast majority of stems are actually yellow birch on um, this kind of established in these sites. And in this case, it's actually a reserve shelter wood approach where they retain uh, 20 square feet of basal area of reserve trees, this is a sugar maple. And what's happened over time, which is quite interesting to observe is that we have this cohort of yellow birch establishing, but now because we have these reserve trees that are sugar maple, there's a carpet of sugar maple coming in beneath that, and so certainly providing that, that long-term option on the site. The final uh, civil cultural system that, that, that's been used and certainly um, it, it remains used in the landscape are clear-cutting base, base methods. As I've been mentioning, really when we think about the natural dynamics of northern hardwood forests, generally we think of these as, you know, gap to mesoscale disturbances, and so, you know, Clear cutting really, there's not a, a, a great natural analog for how often this really would, would have occurred across the landscape, but nonetheless, certainly can be an effective management tool. And what we're seeing really across the region is that clear cutting in particular is being employed as a way to kind of rehabilitate that stand. So in, in cases where we have greater than 60% of that, that forest is in non merchantable stems, there's been some approaches where we're essentially using clear cutting as a way to, to turn that stand over and try to increase the, the quality both of the stems as well as the species mix. One important aspect of this is certainly we've, mo we've moved a long way from kind of the, the historic large block clear cuts devoid of anything. And if we think about kind of a natural analog for any type of you know, clear cut in our systems, it would be a large scale wind disturbance that still would retain um, some living trees across the site. And so much of what we're doing out there are clear cuts with reserves, trying to retain these trees as biological legacies as well as a potential long term you know, seed source on the site. And so using clear cuts in, in, in the cases where there's, there's low quality on the site, and that's certainly where we're seeing that, that applied both um, through the work that Bill Leake's been doing, but also operationally across the landscapes in Vermont where we have very low quality in the stand and inability. Nonetheless, things like regular shelter woods and even the traditional shelter wood approach would be a, another way to transition that stand quality um, if, if, if folks had the time and will to, to do that. So that gives you kind of a, 
a review and maybe some nightmares or flashbacks to your silviculture and it gives you at least a context for how we've been doing things and again much of that's built upon the work that, that Bill Leak and others are doing. I'm going to transition in a minute into thinking more about kind of these adaptive frameworks and, and how we you know, take our, our understanding of these ecosystems and, and put them within the context of a future for us, but um, in the interest of keeping you awake, I'll at least pause for you know a few moments here if folks have any questions, just in kind of the standard um, you know basics of, of northern hardwood management that that I just went over there. All right, so I will move on to thinking about these forests going forward. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, really you know what. I'm going to do today, is, and this relates to kind of the broader um, series that's going to be happening um, through the, these webinars, is that I'm going to start out by talking about kind of a broad framework that's being used, largely um, developed uh, through the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, some of you are familiar with their, their climate change response framework, and then kind of whittle that down to thinking a bit about Northern Hardwoods Forest specifically um, here in Vermont and, and elsewhere across the landscape. And so many folks that, um, you know, saw the title for this this webinar series and, and certainly thought about what we might be talking about today, certainly thought about this within the context of climate change because that really is, is kind of the, the main point of emphasis for, assist for a lot of the efforts that are going on out there. But people that have heard me talk about this before and, and those of you that work in the field already recognize that certainly there's concerns that climate will have some effects on our forests over time that really are going to influence our ability to manage certain species, influence the health of those species. But when we look at any given northern hardwood forest out there in a landscape, and of course I've picked some low-hanging fruit with this mixed ash uh, beach stand, that there are a lot of other things going on out there that are really going to override you know, direct climate effects in the near term. And so there, whether it be beach bark disease, it's been affecting our ability to manage forests for you know over half a century, certainly exotic you know European earthworms that are affecting our ability to manage sugar maple in some places, the threat of Asian longhorn beetle, the threat of emerald ash borer, the influence of overbrowsing by deer, buckthorn, bittersweet, you name it, there are a lot of things that are currently either affecting our forests or threatening our forests and influencing our ability to predictably manage them and sustainably produce what we've always wanted for goods and services from these ecosystems. And so independent of climate change, really when we think about all the factors that either are affecting our forests today or are threatening our forests in the future, really there's a need for us to at least, as we approach developing civil cultural prescriptions for a site, to at least think about it within an adaptive civil culture framework. That is, you know, how are my actions today influencing the ability of this forest to kind of respond and withstand or react to um, these different stressors that are affecting uh, these, or these ecosystems now and into the future. And so there's really the, uh, kind of three ways to, to, to think about the way in which we might go forward from a civil cultural standpoint to manage these systems. And this really is a framework that was developed by Connie Millar, who's a Forest Service scientist at Pacific Southwest Research Station and has been kind of popularized and formalized into kind of some, some frameworks and approaches by the folks at the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. And basically, what the way we think about trying to address these either current stresses or future stresses is that we have three ways to um, categorize our civil cultural objectives and the outcomes that we want from a given forest. And so the first objective really revolves around, you know, that I'm going to try to maintain the current functioning of that forest, withstand any future changes, um, try to basically combat any of the things that might be coming our way, whether it be, you know, withstand the changes that invasives might bring about, withstand the changes that um, might come from alterations in precipitation regimes and do things that are basically able to, to, to resist those, those, those attributes. And so an example might be southern pine management. So a southern pine beetle, you know, when southern pine beetle hits, they essentially, you know, quarantine those areas, get rid of, you know, salvage those areas and replant it right back to, to, to you know, lava like pine. So really just resisting southern pine beetle by controlling it and, and fighting it and, and essentially not modifying much of their management other than, than, than managing that, that insect. The second way of thinking about managing adaptively is that we may accept that things are going to change out there, but we're going to try to do manipulations or management actions in our forest that increase the capacity of that forest to recover and absorb that change. And so it might be getting a well-established understory of advanced regeneration such that if, you know, we have a windstorm event that even though we lose those mature trees, that, that area is rapidly being recaptured by advanced regeneration of species that we desire. Or resilience might be basically, you know, trying to kind of increase the representation of non-ash species in sites where we have 
um, kind of risk of emerald ash borer such that even though ash dies in those sites, we still have other species to, to grow and, and function. So resilience is, is still trying to maintain current conditions to some degree, but allowing them to have some mechanism to respond and absorb that, that change. And the final approach is what we, which used to be called response, which made things easy. We could call it the three R's, but now they call it transition. And basically, this is where we take the information we know about what could be what's going to happen to the forest or projected to happen to the forest, whether it be via insects and diseases or climate, and we actually deliberately manipulate that forest in such a way that we are trying to actively accommodate change. So basically increasing the representation of species like red oak that are projected to do better in a future climate or increasing the representation of species that are non-hosts for a given um, stressor or threat in a landscape. And so trying to transition to that approach. And so one way I like to re represent this, and again, folks that have seen me present on this have, have seen this diagram before, and this, this bar was again from the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science um, Adaptation Workbook, is that this really represents a continuum of options that we have when we think about addressing climate and forest health impacts. And so if we were to take sugar maple forests as an example where, you know, we know that at least some of the projections suggest that in certain places sugar maple is not going to do as well as it did um, historically. Um, one goal might be, you know, we really want to manage for resistance, and so my main goal is I'm going to reduce, you know, try to reduce climate and forest health impacts to the best of my ability and try to maintain current conditions to the best of my ability. And so doing things like single tree selection, um, crop, tree, crop tree management to really promote and, and maintain sugar maple dominance on that site. Nonetheless, we might feel that, you know, we really want this to be sugar maple forest into the future, but we've, we've accepted that it may not be as competitive on that site, and it may make sense to try to increase the abundance of other species that may be able to still sustain some of the functions that we care about in those systems if, in fact, we start experiencing more mortality or declining vigor of sugar maple. And so resilience might use group selection, um, some sort of irregular shelter wood approaches to still maintain sugar maple dominance, but certainly increase the representation of other species that may be projected to do better on that site in the future based on our best available knowledge, so basswood, northern red oak, and others. And then finally, the last would be, you know, we're very concerned about sugar maple's ability to sustain on this site. Maybe we're on a south-facing south gravelly slope. And so as a result, you know, our goal might be to actually intentionally start transitioning that forest to other species or other conditions that might be able to um, better deal with future kind of increased temperatures, increased drought stress on those sites. And so reducing sugar maple and increasing future adapted species on that site um, using, again, some sort of transition approaches like shelter woods um, in, in, in a regular uh, variance. One thing that's important is that we have a lot of experience managing sugar maple forests for sugar maple. We have a lot of experience managing sugar maple forests and increasing the abundance of other species on sugar maple forests, but we have very little experience with, you know, how do we actually transition a forest, um, you know, to kind of another forest type when we're so used to thinking about these systems as sugar maple dominated or northern hardwood systems. And so there's a lot of uncertainty in how we actually would approach these different practices. And as a result, we're really entering a time where there's a need for us to be experimenting out there in the landscape and thinking about how we might get different outcomes from our silviculture. So you notice I used the term future adapted in that, that document. And so those of you that aren't familiar with a lot of what goes into thinking about kind of the future of our forests and, and, and what their vulnerability might be to different stressors, including climate. You know, one of the main tools that's often used is the tree atlas. Um, those of you that haven't ever looked at the tree atlas before, it's a Forest Service product that Lewis Iverson and others have created. If you Google tree atlas, um, you'll go to a website and you can look at the projections for different species. And basically what this, this tool does is project what the future distribution of suitable habitat will be for a given tree species based on um, climate. And so what you're looking at here is a summary that comes from the um, Creating and Maintaining Resilience Forests in Vermont document that the, that the state created um, that basically summarizes, you know, that by 2100 based on a high emissions climate scenario, these are species whose suitable habitat, this is nothing about, you know, their, their distribution, but just to, that their suitable habitat will decrease. And so if we look at the cast of characters in the decreasing list, it's really those species that we characterize as being kind of the, the token northern hardwood species. Um, Nonetheless, there are some species in that forest type, like black cherry, that are projected not to change. Um, white ash under climate is not projected to change, but obviously this asterisk is to remind us that there's many other things white ash has to worry about. And then there are certain species like basswood, northern red oak, black birch, bitternut hickory that under projected climate change are, are expected to actually increase um, across the landscape you know, in terms of the suitable habitat that's out there. This is really not saying they're going to migrate anywhere, it's just saying that 
if we were to plant them places or if they were to a seed were to, to fall in a certain place, it might have a higher probability in 100 years than it did today in terms of its ability to establish and grow. But one thing that's important, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of our emphasis starts getting focused on climate, but there's a lot of other factors that we need to consider in terms of a species' ability to deal with and, and address these changes. And so one thing that, that's worth pointing out is that when we think about any projections of future habitat based on climate, more often than not, the species that are projected to do well under climate are those that either um, are intolerant or mid-tolerant, so basically species that need you know, fairly high light levels. And so if we think about the silvics of these species, again, those species that do well out in the open, you know, kind of intolerant species, tend to be very exposure tolerant and also drought tolerant, whereas species like beech, sugar maple, tend to be much more sensitive to kind of open conditions, have much higher uh, moisture requirements, and as a result, are much more sensitive to projected changes. And so as we go forward and start thinking about our forests, you know, many of the species we think are going to do better in northern hardwood forests are those that actually tend to need larger gaps and kind of to, to establish and persist in those sites. But another thing to factor in is that, again, picking on tree atlas is a great tool. If we look at the tree atlas more, more closely, there's actually another useful piece of information that we can gain from the tree atlas that tells us a bit more about our, our, our tree species that exist in northern hardwood forests and how we should be thinking about those going forward. And what it has is these things called adaptability scores. And so on the left-hand side, we have this, this, this table with these adaptability scores. And essentially, what these scores represent are basically it's a summation of all the functional traits of that species, so its ability to withstand fire, its ability to withstand drought, um, its, its, its tolerance of, of different sites. And it gets a score based on its tolerance of different factors and its response to different factors. And it's a way to think about even though sugar maple may have gotten a low score as it relates to climate change, it's still a species that, you know, based on their criteria, so above 5.2 being considered a high adaptability score, is still quite adaptable given it grows across a wide range of sites and is shade tolerant. So even though, you know, overstory trees might be stressed, they still have the ability to, to rely on seed banks and seedling banks to, to grow. Likewise, red maple is a species that under climate change is projected to actually decline, but we all know that red maple is phenomenally good at, at responding to any type of disturbance we throw at it can grow across a wide range of sites. And so as we look at our forests, we can't just think about them in terms of how climate might affect them. We also need to think about, well, what are the functional traits of the species and what is its ability to respond to disturbance? The same goes for think, arboreal species like aspen or, or northern red oak. The other point to make is that we often get in this trap of looking at tables of species and saying, well, this one's going to decrease, this one's going to increase, and so I'm going to give up on red spruce and, and put all my eggs in the northern red oak basket. But when we've been doing work looking at kind of the variation within species in terms of their response to climate, and this is just a graph summarizing just the, the range of responses of this is red maple, red oak, sugar maple, et cetera, to temperature. And what we find is that actually the range of responses of an individual species, so that the, the range that exists within a species is actually greater than the range that exists between species. And so there's much more variability within an individual species and its response to climate than there is between, really speaking to the inherent adaptive capacity that a species might have to deal with climate change. All this is to say that, you know, really we shouldn't just be giving up on certain tree species and should be maintaining them as part of the mix and, and allowing um, things to play out in terms of that adaptive approach. And along those lines, you know, when we think about retaining trees on sites, you know, traditionally we've done this in, in, in the mode to think about it in terms of biodiversity or carbon or leaving large mature trees out in the site for, the, for those purposes. But now when we're thinking about in terms of management, really the goal is to think about these also as repositories of genetic variation, basically to, to leave species on the site even if they're not projected to do well or maybe emerald ash borers in an area, maybe leaving some ash behind, not removing all that ash to see if there's basically tested against the ash. Um, ash borer to see if there's some inherent variation and resistance to those species and using it as a way to kind of increase the mix and op opportunities that we have in terms of responding to these stressors that are out there in the landscape. So I'm going to get into talking a little bit, you know, to end here about just the way we might recategorize and think about our silviculture in northern hardwoods within the context of, of climate change and other, other stressors like invasive species and disturbance and, and, and insects and diseases. And one thing to bear in mind is that some of what we're going to talk about is really run-of-the-mill, solid, traditional silviculture and how we've always approached northern hardwood management. And really the biggest difference is just thinking about these within the context of, well, does this resist change? Does it kind of accommodate that change? And, and are there ways I might modify that approach to kind of increase the resilience or kind of the adaptive capacity of this forest going forward?
And so the resistance approach is really, as I mentioned, you know, the goal of these is to try to maintain that forest in its current condition to the best of our ability. And so an even age stands, you know, one of the, the main approaches would be kind of your standard thinning operation where we're just trying to increase the vigor of the crop trees. If, the, if we do have drought periods, reducing the drought stress by increasing available moisture to those trees that are that are on the site. And also even thinking about in the context of ice storms, you know, selecting trees that have canopy structures that are less prone to um, can be damaged by ice, so those species that have kind of high crotches, you know, trying to try to minimize um, those types of um, structures. If we have rich sites, as I mentioned, those sites where we can reliably get um, regeneration or historically reliably get regeneration of sugar maple, you know, actually thinking about maintaining, you know, that dominance through single tree selection or small group selection on those sites, but maintaining that high canopy cover if our goal is to really um, you know, keep these to the best of our ability as, as, a, as a northern hardwood system that's dominated by sugar maple. One thing that's useful to think about this is that those rich sites really, you know, in, inherently have some resilience to climate change, particularly if we're dealing with north-facing kind of enriched sites where, you know, some of those broader scale climate effects might be buffered at the local scale by just the quality of that site. And certainly in terms of resistance approaches, and one of the other webinars has dealt, dealt with this, is if we're trying to resist the changes that are associated with invasives, obviously it's a, a daunting and almost impossible task to do at the state level but certainly at the stand scale, trying to the best of our ability to reduce or eliminate the impact of invasive species on site via either mechanical or, or chemical, or even some folks are getting into thinking about goats and other ways to, to, to get rid of those, those species on the site. When we get into those other approaches that, that we kind of label as resilience or transition, really when we're using silviculture prescriptions to create these either resilient or adaptive conditions, Really the main focus of these approaches should be on trying to increase the levels of complexity both compositionally but also in terms of the structure of that forest um, on, the, on both the stand scale and then across the landscape. And one of the key elements, and this goes back to those adaptability scores I just talked about a few moments ago, is trying to increase the level of what we call the response diversity in that forest. And so most of us are comfortable with the idea of species diversity, kind of what's the number of species present in an area. But what response diversity is doing is, is taking that species label and instead we're looking at what are the range of responses that are in this forest in terms of the response to disturbance, the response to drought. And so, you know, a simple example would be you have a sugar maple forest that has an ash component in it. Well, the response diversity in that forest, emerald ash borers, you have two different responses. One is vulnerable, one is not. And so if you have EAB going to that stand, at least there's some inherent resilience because you have a, a non-susceptible host. Likewise, in terms of wind disturbance, certainly some things respond to wind by having advanced regeneration that can capture the site following overstory death. Others can sprout readily. Others have widely dispersed seed via wind. They can come and colonize the site. And so instead of just looking at the species mix in terms of just, you know, this is a sugar maple, this is a beech, you know, what does that species have from a functional standpoint that may or may not allow it to respond favorably um, or in when there's a disturbance or other change in that environment. And so the goal really is by having this high level of complexity, both at the stand and landscape scale, we're really creating an opportunity for multiple ways for that forest to recover um, the following disturbance or following um, changes in climate or, or introduce insects and diseases. And so when we think about these approaches, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of the emphasis is on trying to at least increase the representation of those response traits that are are projected to do better in the future. And so trying to regenerate species that at least based on our best knowledge, whether it's our knowledge of what the host species are for a given insect or disease, or it's our knowledge of um, what the browse preferences of, of deer in a region, or our knowledge of what species are drought tolerant versus not, or are heat stress tolerant versus not, it's really trying to find ways to increase the representation of those species that we think are going to do better in the future based on our understanding of, of, of future conditions. And so trying to use those regeneration methods that we know in northern hardwood systems have provided the greatest opportunity for recruiting a range of species as opposed to single tree selection where we really have a narrow focus on, on tolerance. And so group and patch selection, certainly a regular shelter wood approaches, as well as even age methods certainly modified to, to the two age variant where we're retaining legacies on those sites. At the same time, thinking about ways to not just increase representation of a range of species, but also representation of a range of structural conditions. And so things like variable density thinning, as well as just the, always integrating reten retention of biological legacies into our management. And so as an example of this not being rocket science, even as much as I like to think that the field I study in is really high tech stuff, um, a lot of what we do is, is fairly practical. And the goal is really trying to understand you know, 
how objectives are being met. And so I'm going to give a fairly simplistic example of at least one type of approach that can be viewed through the eyes of resilience, even though in many cases this is just a standard civil cultural practice to try to achieve both structural diversity and compositional diversity in the landscape. And so this is just a, a short little summary of some work that we did looking at pat selection harvest in Western Mass. These are these are 90-year-old northern hardwood stands, even age forests, very similar to what we have extending into southern Vermont. And basically, the silviculture prescription was patch selection, you know, following Bill Leake's recommendations. So these are third-acre gaps. All the pre-existing beach was felled at the time of gap creation, so all existing advanced regeneration beach was, was removed with a brush saw. And then across these treatments, we had various levels of structural retention, either no retention in the gaps or a certain proportion of the unacceptable growing stop was, was retained as dead wood in the gaps, or we actually retained live trees in the gaps as a, as a goal to increase complexity of structure. And so these are just a summary of some of the results in terms of the, 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 the sapling layer three years following treatment. So if we look at the control sites, this gray bar is, is beach, and so you know, very similar to the situation many of us deal with, you know, heavy beach component. And so if we look at this forest, obviously single tree selection, all we're going to do is certainly keep, keep promoting that. Whereas we get into actually where patch selection was done, the beach component is much released, re reduced, and we start seeing a higher diversity, things like red maple, um, black birch, black cherry even in some of these sites. And what I've done is, again, is to show you that basically, you know, this, this, the goal of this treatment was not to think about climate change, but we can still recalibrate our thinking to, to focus on it that way. I've just put a, a, a minus or a sign or a plus sign above a given species, depending on whether or not it's projected to do better under climate change or not. Right? And so if we look at kind of the control stand, all the species that were dominating that stand actually are are projected to do poorly, so it's a very vulnerable condition. But by doing that patch selection treatment as well as retention treatments, we've actually introduced kind of some diversity in that stand that actually is, is projected to do better in a future climate. And so we now have a species mix there that we have some options if, in fact, we start seeing dramatic climate change effects. Of course, we've also increased the striped maple component. And so, you know, one of the future goals on a site like this would be if I really care about trying to increase representation of that response diversity, maybe I'll deliberately start releasing some of those species that have the potential to be to be future adapted on that on that site. But really not not much different. One thing that might become different, and I know many folks on the on the webinar already are doing this, but if it's something that we, we need to be thinking more critically about, is that northern hardwood management's always been a fantastic you know, system to, to think about because a lot of what we got back naturally is what we wanted, right? Basically, sugar maple, we might have had some beach, but it was a minor component. But with beach bark disease, certainly invasive species, we're now getting regeneration mixes that really are a bunch of minuses in terms of the future adaptability of those to, to, to stressors as well as the ability of those, those systems to sustain the goods and services we need. And so, again, Bill Leake's work spoken to it, Ralph Nyland's work spoken to it, some of that work I just showed you really reflects it, that the, it's critical that as we get into regeneration phase, if our goal is to really increase the representation of other species on those sites, that we are taking deliberate actions either through site preparation or following up, in the example of that last, last study, doing things like crop tree release early on to start increasing the representation of species other than beech um, or invasives on these sites, and so trying to kind of manipulate those stands. Obviously, this is an investment in the stand from a cost perspective, but if we think about the long-term economic gains from a stand that's dominated by beach as opposed to one that's dominated by a more favorable mix, um, I think that the cost could be justified depending on, on the ownership and, and the, the long-term goals. So the final component are these transition components, and I, I don't have data to show on this because we have very little um, experience with this. Even a regular shelter woods, as much as they've become a very popular approach, um, really around the eastern U.S., they certainly have all been popular in Europe for a long time, um, we have very little experience with irregular sheltered woods in northern hardwood forests beyond kind of a standard extended irregular sheltered wood that some of the work that, that, that Ralph Allen has been, been doing. And so we have very little experience, but if we think about these from a conceptual standpoint, you know, irregular as well as conventional shelter woods really are the civil cultural approaches that seem most suited for transitioning forests and trying to increase representation of other species that might be future adapted. And there's two reasons for this. One is that it's actually a gradual transition over time, and so we are either if it's an expanding gap shelter wood, regular shelter wood, or a continuous cover regular shelter wood. You know, over time we are progressively removing mature trees, creating a range of regeneration niches out there, but always retaining some level of mature forest structure um, that allows us to have kind of this irregularity and structure in the landscape that um, provides habitat benefits as well as certainly benefits in terms of complexity and response to, to change. 
And one thing that, that's certainly happening in some cases, and again, Lou gets, I always pick on this example, but some of, the, some of the sites we visited, certainly there's been some efforts to actually increase the representation of species that aren't currently on site. So this isn't a regular shelter wood in, in northeastern Vermont. And basically what's happened in some cases is they've sowed some acorns of red oak into this, this, this site. Red oak is not currently on this site. The real reason they sowed acorns onto this site was to create future options from a management standpoint going forward. But you could easily view this as also creating future options for this stand in terms of you know, if climate, and these are shallow, droughty soils, continues to be a problem here, they're now increasing representation of a species that, that's at least projected to do better on that site. And so as much as we're not in the business of planting or seeding in our forests, there might be cases where at least localized, low-cost application might at least increase the range of options out there in the landscape. And a final comment about just these adaptive approaches is that, before we wrap up here, many of these assessments, and again, we're very spoiled in Vermont. We have this phenomenal book um, on kind of creating and maintaining resilient forests in Vermont. But that is a statewide assessment, and many of the assessments we hear about kind of the vulnerability of forests are even broader. And, you know, when we get into silviculture, really it is largely a site-level business. And so when we think about these vulnerability assessments, there's a need for us to filter those down to the stand scale. Basically, as I mentioned earlier, are you on a rich site in the north-facing slopes that even though sugar maple may be projected to decline over that broader region, is it a place where it makes a lot of sense to still manage that species and sustain that species given that site is going to buffer some of the broader scale climatic effects? Likewise, you know, should you really be worrying about emerald ash borer if you're 300 miles away from it? Or should you be thinking more about managing that ecosystem in a different way? And so trying to understand, you know, even though we have vulnerability at a broad scale, you know, where, where does it make sense to be kind of doing the management at the site scale? The same idea goes to the silvicultural approach. You know, I think, you know, particularly with these challenges, and I'm sure all of you are disappointed that at the end of this presentation, I'm not giving you any silver bullet whatsoever in terms of how to deal with all these issues, but that's not the way silviculture is meant to work, right? It really never was meant to be, you know, here's one size fits all strategy. These systems you know, that from their European roots really were site specific. Um, as an example, those of you that have, have read that great Journal of Forestry paper by Patricia Raymond, um, if you look at the name of a lot of our regular shelterwood approaches as historically where they originated from, basically there is a namesake associated to where that came from. I'm referring to a region within Europe, and basically what that is reflecting is these silvicultural approaches, approaches were very site-specific. They weren't meant to be applied over over continents. And of course, our, our local example now in, in, in Maine with Bob Seymour's group, again, reflecting that that is being catered to kind of the the mixed mix woods in, that they're working with up there in, 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 in central Maine. So as a final couple of points, um, basically, you know, whether you're concerned about climate change or not, obviously there's a lot of other things that it's hard to ignore that are affecting our forests, whether it be invasive species or, or um, certainly the influence of, of, of beach bark disease on, on many of our northern hardwood systems. So there's really a need to take a lot of the great information we have about traditional silvicultural approaches to, to northern hardwoods and recast those in, in the context of you know, what may or may not work um, within the context of a changing forest. And so some of those approaches are going to be you know, how we've always done things, you know, resistance, you know, single tree selection, thinning, you know, trying to maintain a vigor and, and maintain kind of compositional inertia on a site. But other of, the, other of these approaches are really going to involve us doing some experimentation. And I would argue we're already into that phase with you know, a lot of folks starting to use the regular shelter woods in the state. Um, a variable density thinning is now being applied in places. You know, a lot of this being motivated by the civil culture with birds in mind work. And as a result, you know, there's, a, there's a time for us to start learning from you know, how effective are these approaches? Likewise, you know, what, how effective are some of these rehabilitation approaches that are occurring on these sites with the heavy, heavy, heavy peach stands? And as I mentioned, you know, we tend to get in this trap of, of assuming that, you know, here's a, here's a list of, of species that are projected to decline. You know, I'm going to give up on it or, or, you know, all the sugar maple is going to be gone in 100 years. And really, that's not the case. We know that these overstory trees can withstand a tremendous amount of, of stress over time. And so as a result, when we think about how we're going to regenerate these forests going forward, we need to think about it within the context of those overstory trees being present. So using, again, either shelter wood or, or selection-based approaches that are maintaining that canopy cover, both to maintain options but also ameliorate the extremes on those sites that might occur. And then finally, you know, as, as, you know, as I spoke to early on, you know, we are very spoiled in that we already have a good knowledge base to rely upon in terms of how different sites respond to different civil culture prescriptions. Site really matters, you know, and again, you know, Bill Leake and Ralph Madden's work speaks to this. And this is, is the same as we think about vulnerability, you know, fine-tuning those vulnerability assessments to the site you're working on, but also, you know, cataloging and, and monitoring how do your adaptive approaches 
work and function on a given site. You know, that example I had where they sowed acorns. You know, does, is it even going to? You know, are those the right sites to be doing that on? You know, what, how does that operate on a rich mesic site where we really, really might be dealing with a lot of competition from other species? And so, trying to keep track of those different factors. And then finally, you know, there's a there's a heavy focus when we think about the future of our forest on just the species that will exist there. But it's also important to really continue and to begin, if you aren't already, using approaches that actually try to restore and increase a level of complexity and structure in our forest. You know, basically the response of a small sugar maple versus a big sugar maple, the climate is very different. And so trying to capitalize on that diversity and response within species that will, you know, reflect differences in size, differences in age, as well as just the importance of things like dead wood out there in the landscape, certainly during dry periods, it's a sponge out there in the forest, as well as its importance as habitat and, and for sustaining nutrient cycling as we go forward, and so making sure that's a part of what you do. And so today, as I mentioned, it's certainly maybe dissatisfying that I was unable to um, provide you a, with the silver bullet that would, would, would solve climate change, but really we don't really have a sense for how to you know, manage for all this uncertainty. Really, I think the important part is recalibrating our approach and thinking about, you know, what am I doing out there in the landscape and, and how is that either enhancing the ability of that forest to deal with these, these uncertainties out there or are there ways I might refine what I'm doing to hopefully increase the potential of that forest to sustain the functions we care about going forward. So I will take any questions folks have and appreciate you, um, you know, staring back at me across the computer screen. Great, thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate uh, the presentation this morning. And we do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, in the meantime, as uh, folks folks start to ponder the questions, just a reminder, you can go ahead and submit your question in the question box on the side panel uh, on the GoToWebinar system. If the side panel isn't uh, there, you can also go up to view, click on that, and just make sure that the question um, uh, is checked in that uh, drop-down menu. Uh, so, Tony, a question did come in. Um, somebody's interested in learning your thoughts on group size to develop a dense blackberry patch as a nurse crop for hardwood saplings with a high deer browse preference? So those um, third acre gaps, we, we had a very dense, um, I still have some scars from it, um, blackberry patch. It's, it, it seemed, you know, on those, I mean, obviously part of it is a kind of a landscape feature. You know, if it's, if it's the only third acre gap out there, um, you know, that has really dense growth and everything else is closed canopy forest and there's a potential that they're still going to try to hone in on those areas but certainly the ability to you know over a, a given area you know if, if you're managing a 20 acre parcel you know creating 10 to 20 percent of that area in, in gaps of those sizes depending on your cutting cycle length um, you know we, we've, we found at least in that case there was some of that buffering um, obviously leaving tops if possible to, to also inhibit um, you know, browse activity in those spots but at that threshold and obviously getting larger, um, you start losing, depends on what you're looking for in terms of um, you know, compositional goals, but at least from our perspective, you know, and, and again, Bill's work showed it as well, I mean, that third acre gap size is, seems to be you know, kind of a, a comfortable, he's gone up to a half acre gap size as well, but it really depends on the objectives and how, how large an opening you want, how from the landscape, um, but that, that was certainly, you know, the responses we received with that, um, that size opening seemed to be quite adequate. And all, I mean, it obviously depends on the, just the, the uh, deer pressure in, the, in a given area, but that um, certainly seemed to work. Great, and then another question, um, your thoughts on hay-scented uh, and New York ferns. Do you see a dense swath of these ferns as a bioindicator of nutrient depletion or poorly buffered sites? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the hay-scented fern, I mean, I think it's, a, I guess, a mix of factors. I, you know, there, there's certainly been some work that also speaks to, you know, he heavy deer browse um, also, um, you know, exacerbating that impact, and so, you know, it's, I think it's a combination of both. You know, you have, you know, change in site quality, but also, it, you know, the, any woody stems on those sites, you know, are, are being clipped back, and so the ability to actually get um, recruitment and kind of, you know, replacement of that hay-scented fern under story is is a challenge. But, um, you know, there's been some work that certainly has looked at, and I know in, in southern Vermont, folks have done, you know, some back backpack sprayer, you know, basically removing hay-scented fern. I think the key with with those approaches is. Um, you know, the objective is to kind of build up that advanced regeneration on the site um, to kind of get something in place that can, can out-compete and replace that. But, um, you know, I'm not, you know, in terms of the differences and, and what that indicates in terms of site quality, you know, I really would not be the one to speak to that. But certainly um, there, there's some indication that it's also not just a, a site change, but a change in just a um, herbivory on the herbivory can also kind of exacerbate that problem quite a bit. Great. A question about red oak. Uh, 
in seeding red oak, where is it not where it's not currently present? What is the best way to acquire and apply acorns? Is the acorn stock readily available? Yeah, so there there's actually a, believe it or not a, a, a device called a bag of nut. Uh, put it all on your 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 birthday wish list. Um, basically, um, if you really do get into you know heavy interest in in, in oak, um, you know there, there's the ability to kind of go to local oaks. You know whether it's an oak growing in a cemetery or you know where it'd be large you know acorn crop or, or you know kind of local kind of open grown oaks and you can basically it looks almost like a kind of a traditional uh, manual lawnmower you kind of push the lawn it kind of sucks up the acorns and it allows you to collect a lot in, in a localized area but obviously the, the, the ideal situation would be to work you know if you have oak in that region to try to collect some from some local populations um, and then in terms of sowing them on the site I mean oak certainly um, as I mentioned is a species that can germinate on litter but um, establishment success actually is enhanced by a mineral soil contact and so it's a, it's a species that um, you know ideally you, you can sow um, with either some local scarification or if you have skid trails or other kind of in, in um, inadvertent scarification. The issue with with oak you know as well is certainly you put a pile of acorns out there and um, you have to, you know the potential for carnivory and kind of um, depredation by small mammals and so making sure you're getting enough kind of a, a rate out there that can kind of saturate that that need but I think you know if you, if you kind of from a landscape scale obviously oak is found in you know our northern hardwood forest but um, it tends to be you know on south facing slopes or where you have kind of an adjacent ridge that's providing a seed source and so on some of these sites you know if you have a rich you know northern hardwood stand you know obviously you, you could probably get an acorn to grow in there but it's, it's, it's certainly going to be out competed um, you know, by, by other species that are that are much more suited and, and really kind of fine-tuned to working on those sites, and so the need both even on poor sites to to, to control competition if you do get oak established to favor that, so reducing beach competition, but also um, making sure you're managing that advanced regeneration. It's a species that can establish advanced regeneration on the site, and and you really won't get it into the overstory unless there is advanced regeneration present, um, and so making sure you're kind of cultivating that advanced regeneration um, in advance of um, some sort of overstory removal treatment, but uh, I would I guess the bottom line is if you can get a local source, I'd recommend it. And if you want to get into the business of of large scale seed collection, then there are some tools you can buy. And again, that bag of nut is one. But also, um, you know, checking with the New Hampshire State Nursery to see if they have um, you know oak stock there that would be, uh, I mean, seed seed collections there that would be suitable for where you're working. Great. And then uh, I guess a, just a comment uh, from Patrick Bartlett that we have a supply of sprouted acorns in April every year. So it sounds like they have a good local source down there. Great. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Is any more questions? Um, just to give folks another opportunity to add one or two more questions here. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. As I mentioned in the introduction to the webinar series this morning, uh, this is part of a mini series on local silviculture. So over the next few months, we hope to bring you more webinars, uh, specifically looking at the eastern hemlock, oak, pine, and, and spruce fir systems. Please stay tuned to your email uh, for announcements about these uh, future webinars. One more question, uh, Tony, before we let you go that's come in. Do you think that a 10 to 15 year cutting interval is too soon for re-entry? Yeah, I mean, in one, before I answer this question, if other folks have follow-up questions, just feel free to um, you know, send me a, an email. I'm happy to, to work with that. You know, it's, it seems like in terms of the I mean, obviously, site matters, you know, quite a bit, and and so and also the system you're using. Um, but but generally, you know, at least looking at Bill Leak's work and others' work, it seems like a 15-year cutting cycle um, tends to be, you know, in, in Ralph Allen's work as well, kind of an appropriate return interval just based on the growth and, and the and the you know the, the level of recruitment we might get under those systems. And so, 10, I would say, again, based on their experience, um, again, it really is, is probably a bit too soon, depending on the objective. If your goal really, you know, is to transition that site and 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 you're working more in kind of a regular shelterwood system, you know, or basically your, your re-entry interval might be, you know, every every 10 years or so, depending on how you're approaching that. And it also it varies on this. In that in that case, again, not thinking strictly on even aged, um, if you're if you have species like oak or others that are are more intermediate in tolerance that might need kind of a quicker release, then that would make sense within kind of some of those irregular shelterwood approaches. But in terms of single tree selection and even um, depending on how you're applying group selection, yet you, you know, 15 years seems to be kind of a, you know, at least based on Bill's work and others' work, a fairly reasonable um, you know, kind of lower lower level for the reentry on those sites. Great. 
Great. Th thank you again, Tony. Thank you so much for your time this morning and for uh, for presenting this webinar. Uh, just one last quick reminder for folks participating on the webinar this morning. Um, when you uh, when the webinar finishes, you will receive an email asking you to complete a survey. Um, please take a few minutes to go ahead and complete that. It will. You will also receive an email, a follow up email after the webinar, um, it, with uh, a link to the survey as well. So we appreciate your feedback. And um, again, thank you everybody for joining us this morning before you head out in the woods. Uh, and thank you, Tony, for. Uh, an excellent presentation. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.